Thanks. Thank you. So, um, well, yeah, I'm the Global Topic Lead Container Technology at SAP. So, um, we in our department um, are creating um, the architecture to uh, deploy Kubernetes at SAP. And Thomas basically is working together with us. So, yeah. Thomas? Yeah. yeah. So, this is the second talk at the Berlin Buzzword. So, I've been here last year exactly about this topic, but without Stefan. So, it has developed a little bit. And actually, everybody knows now there is something like Docker, and everybody's talking about microservices. But if you come to a startup like SAP, which is a big company with a big business and a big containers, then you face completely different problems. So if you switch to the next sheet, so then we will see what they told us. Containers are for shipping. We build containers. It's a unique format. And you can roll out containers. And then if you, it's like any other technology, if you put something out in the wild, people play with it and people do things. And then the scene is changing. So the next shows what people are also doing in com containers. So housing in containers. This was not intended, but somehow, yeah, looks, hmm, looks usable. You can house in containers. So this is like the thing we had uh, if you talk about Containers and microservices it was mostly intended to run stateless services in containers, so no data. You know the cattle and pet uh, picture, so containers in production have been considered as pets, and then if uh, have considered as cattle, and if, if you don't need them anymore, throw them away. But then this is a picture from turnoff.us. So it's how they see the way of dealing with legacy software. Everybody who has survived three months of having a business, in my experience, has legacy software. Everybody, every startup after three months has kind of this dragon. And then if you are successful, this dragon is making the money for you. And therefore you cannot kill the dragon because he, he earns your, your income, more or less, so um, you, are, you have to deal with it. So this is a picture of, you see, yes, let's do a cloud native app a little bit, and uh, that's exactly what we face at SAP. They have more than one dragon, they have lots of dragons there. And you see cloud architects, so they do the wizardry, try to influence the entire beast, uh, you see the line of dead project managers lying around, sysadmins and database admins trying to fight them, senior developers try to keep it under control. So this is exactly the picture. You, uh, you find the, the, the guys exactly understood what's happening. And the opposite is also true. If you have no legacy, you don't have a business. And to be, to be honest, the next picture, uh, People are doing something completely different with, with containers than we have imagined. Google is known to run everything in containers, so they have, must have found a way of running even their windows in the Google Cloud in containers somehow. And the solution is normally you put a KVM inside a container, which is reversing the thing you would expect, and put, uh, put a container around a hypervisor, which is weird. And uh, what I always tell people in trainings, this is not the first thing you should do with a container. But if you go to customers and they say, oh, we have this SAP R2 system, R2, not R3, it's even older than R3, and it's running on Windows servers only, which are very old, and we have paying customers which pay us not to be migrated to the latest technology. It's quite impossible to say no, and actually it works. So we tested it, and uh, you see the final really book is uh, coming out. 
in the next uh, week. So Windows in Kubernetes definitely is a topic. And uh, this picture is from Limulus Polyphemus. It's a living fossil. So uh, this way, uh, you have an imagination what's really happening out there if a customer has a business and wants to move its business into the container and, and Kubernetes world. But and not this, this to take this wrong. I yeah. mean, there's also a use case to run windows and containers. For example, um, you have built infrastructure, like we have a lot at SAP. We are building software for Linux, for Windows, for whatever. Yeah? Different versions of this, different versions of that. So we are now moving to uh, build our stuff and test our builds and do optimizations in containers. But what about Windows? Because we also need to do the same stuff for Windows. So should we run two infrastructures, like a container infrastructure and a Windows server infrastructure, probably in a VM infra uh, infrastructure? Or should we just move the Windows VMs into containers though? So what we surely do is we build up a Kubernetes cluster, we put the Linux builds into containers, and we put the Windows virtual machines into containers because Windows containers are not ready as of now. You cannot use that in production. So um, we basically build our software then in a VM on a container. Yeah, and the interesting part is, after we have done this, they told us, oh, it's less pain than running Windows the Windows way. So uh, containers are not solving the problem, but they are kind of relief, uh, mitigation of the pain of running Windows systems in containers. So this is kind of what you can expect if you go to real customers with a real business. And it seems to work, and um, we uh, there are recipes in the net, how to do it. Took us more or less two or three weeks to build the entire ecosystem around it, and then you have this kind of solution. Yeah. And, okay, we talked a lot about Kubernetes. I cannot expect that everybody of you knows what Kubernetes is. Uh, Kubernetes is now, in the moment, one of the fastest developing open source projects. It's from Google. It's a Google infrastructure for everybody else, the Jiffy part. The meaning of this uh, thing is you have the same root of the word as governor or cybernetics. So it's uh, Kubernetes is governing uh, the entire container system. Uh, Google has an older system, which is a kind of joke with, with the words, they call it Borg. And the Borgs, um, you might know, uh, lived in cubes. So the, this is kind of an internal Google joke. Uh, for us, important, it's uh, in our entire open source ecosystem. It's written in Go, and uh, the idea is not to manage machines anymore. If you look into the open stack or our, um, virtualization environment of VMware or the other clouds, it's all about how I manage my machines, and this is not about managing machines. The outcome of a Kubernetes cluster must be you manage your applications, not your machines anymore. So it's well suited for DevOps environment, and that's uh, what is the intention behind it. So you want to get away of the pain of running hardware. This is a promise, but I think you so, delivered so, something. So to take over at this point, um, what Thomas just described is you know your application needs some amount of CPU, some amount of uh, memory, and stuff like this. Yeah? Before containers, before Kubernetes, you were just going there and saying, OK, I need a machine or a VM that has, uh, let's say, 12, uh, 12 cores and um, like 60 gigabytes of RAM that I can execute my application. With container infrastructure, and Kubernetes, you basically describe that in one manifest, and then you just deploy your application once, twice, three times, four times, doesn't matter. And Kubernetes takes, uh, takes over to schedule this on one of the nodes inside the cluster, which basically offers to share the, the infrastructure, the hardware, between multiple applications, so you can even run multiple applications in parallel on the same hardware. Yeah? 
And uh, the point is, you describe it in a definition for your application. You don't have to describe a virtual machine, you don't have to describe an operating system, you don't have to describe anything about it, you just describe your container and what you need for it. And then you deploy it anywhere on Kubernetes. That's all. And that makes things much more easy and uh, also comes along with the DevOps approach because the devs now take over the ops also without you having to do ops at the point. Yeah, and this leads to the next slide because here um, we have a 10,000 feet view, view on Kubernetes basically. So um, you have multiple possibilities to work with Kubernetes. Basically the final one is the API. So um, the API way connects to the API server and the API server basically um, puts the information into etcd and the scheduler and the controllers take over the information from etcd. And the CLI basically implements the API and talks with the API server as well. In the UI is just an application to do the same. Yeah. And at the end, um, all this is communicating with Kubelets. Kubelet is basically the local uh, administration application on the real machines that orchestrates the uh, container runtime that is running on the machine to uh, build the containers or to run the containers basically inside the machine. So what you really care about is you are either someone or an application or whatever. Yeah? You use an API and you have a container cluster done. You don't need anything else. So. Yeah, so, and what we also find is we have, uh, if we deploy an application, for example, there are very valuable patterns for this. For example, the f deployment now is a first class citizen of Kubernetes. So, if you do a deployment, the first thing which is created is a replica set. And the replica set is creating actually the number of applications or a number of pods, which are collections of containers you need. So you roll out um, any application through a replica set, and the replica set cares that exactly the number you want to have is deployed somewhere in your cluster. If your cl cluster is a thousand machines big, it has it asks your scheduler where to place my application, where can I put them, and spread them over the cluster. And if you do an update one th uh, in the future, another replica set is spawned and you get another a replica somewhere and then it should disappear here, but uh, okay, did not survive everything from PowerPoint, but um, doesn't matter, you get a new replica set with a new version and then it's a well-defined thing that you do a rolling rollout in a replica set from a new version to an old version. And you can even roll back if you, uh, if you announce the image and something did not work. The rollout also would stop if something breaks, if you have an image which is not valid or somehow uh, the readiness and the, uh, the health probes of the container are not working. So the rollout does not wipe out your entire service because this can be connected to a, an, another Kubernetes entity, a service, which collects all your applications into a single thing and does a round robin around it. So this is kind of the first time I've seen a rolling update as a first class citizen in, a Kuber, in, in, in an orchestration cluster. And by the way, you don't have to do rolling updates. You can also do blue-green deployments, as you see, blue and green. So you can say, okay, I want to have my new application now deployed here, but I just want to, uh, to have 20% of the traffic go into the new application because I don't want to have, if there's some bug in or something like that, I want to not to fail all the customers, but only every fifth customer. So um, I do a blue-green deployment, so I have both versions of my application running in the cluster, and Kubernetes takes care of directing the, the load to the different pods on the different versions. So if I see there's an error in the new version, I can just roll it back. So all fine, old version there, and customers running with the old version only. So 
But if I see everything works out, then I can surely remove the blue part, so the old version, and lead the customers only to the green part. Yeah, which is quite outstanding because um, before I've been at Endocode, I've been at uh, one bigger Berlin internet company here, and we needed, uh, I think, three or four years to implement for all applications on that platform a rolling update and quite of a stable and successful way of deploying applications as a role and updating them without service interruption. And this is, without service interruption is quite important because this means that you can do continuous live deployments and, and things like this and you don't have to care about uh, versions, you simply say to the developers, your version has to comply with other versions plus minus one or two uh, minor versions that you uh, don't break the interfaces too fast. This, this means you have a uh, always on platform where you can really do multiple deployments a day. So, but we don't want to say that Kubernetes solves the problems of updates and uh, also solves the problem that uh, you might have a downtime because if you're running, for example, databases, and the databases need to convert the data from one version to another, you surely need a downtime, because you cannot run one version and the other version in parallel with the same data store. Yeah? So uh, there are applications where you cannot do it, and there are also applications like uh, if you have an application server that uh, doesn't support multi-instances, so you have to store everything in one application server instead of in two, so then you cannot run two pods in parallel. Yeah, so this means you have to either switch directly, which is also possible in Kubernetes, so uh, basically replace it uh, with a deployment. Um, so as soon as the new pod gets healthy, you remove the old one and switch completely to the new one. Yeah, but um, yeah, so Kubernetes doesn't solve all the problems because Kubernetes doesn't or isn't able to join your application, to look into your application, to change your application, to add support for things that your application doesn't support. So only what is possible with your application gets much more easy with Kubernetes because you don't have to reinstall an operating system, you don't have to update your uh, virtual machine or your real hardware, you don't have to care about update scenarios because with a container you just exchange the application. No, the, with its overall environment. So you don't have to uh, update an application within a container. Yeah? You just exchange it. That's done. Yeah. So, so and if you look into a typical, um, more sophisticated application stack, you see you not only have databases and uh, the web portal, you also have hidden layers. For example, the load balancer is part of your application because you might have load balancer rules. If you ever played with F5i rules, then you know what I'm talking about. And you see there are stateless uh, layers, for example, the, the upper four, and there are stateful layers. So you have kind of storage, you have your SQL databases, your NoSQL databases, and you should not underestimate the state in your messaging system. If you run a Kafka, a kind of RabbitMQ or ZeroMQ or any messaging system, this messaging system has state and is therefore part of the persistent layer. And this way you can make everything except this layer stateless so uh, if you separate your applications and you have your business logic on this layer, you have, might have a Redis cache which is not really stateful because it can be regenerated on the fly. And you have the web portal faces to the outside and you have the load balancer rules. And therefore, it's absolutely important to, before you start a project, to identify the stateful layers and anything which is not stateful the kettle part can be put into Kubernetes immediately without hassle. So it's quite easy to put this uh, stateless application there in and then you can do all the ro uh, rolling updates. But if you have database, every database more or less has its own replication idea. 
if you look into Postgres or into MongoDB or you name it, every application is different and you have to handle database by database if you have to bring a database into Kubernetes. This is now possible with stateful sets. They are something which is located on a machine where you might have a hard disk, you might have SSDs for your data, and then you can run a beast like HANA in memory, which is backed by kind of uh, disk space, and then you can run even HANA databases in, in Kubernetes. And last year, everybody discussed things like, are containers ready for production? Is this prepared for the enterprise? And I would say yes, if SAP is an enterprise company, and if HANA is something you would run in production, which is more or less the case now. Well, but you, you can also uh, stay with uh, outstateless application sets um, and run stateful applications, because if you have a storage layer that has a distribution over the overall cluster, then you're able to um, connect to the data on every node. So it doesn't matter if you store the data locally to this node, because it's also viable on any other node in the cluster. And that is something, uh, for example, uh, we also work on to get uh, the distributed storage engines to automatically detect the disks in the cluster nodes in the Kubernetes cluster and offer them to the applications on Kubernetes. So, next yeah. slide, right? So, um, the ecosystem we are working on um, is basically what you see here. So uh, we have uh, CoreOS um, currently uh, delivered as container Linux. Um, we are using the container runtime Rocket. Uh, I'll move here better uh, because uh, otherwise you might uh, hear this sound again. <laughs> so um, we are using Rocket uh, as the container runtime. I mean, most of you might know Docker instead. Um, why, do we, why do we use Rocket while uh, most of the people use Docker? Well, um, I will explain that in deep later, but in general, um, Rocket uh, doesn't offer um, full rights right away. So you have to give every single right to uh, the application in the container, while Docker offers the full rights right away. So for example, if you start a container with Rocket in Kubernetes, uh, you will be the user named root. But root cannot do a change mod to a file, it cannot do a chown, it cannot uh, do a zoo, not a zoodoo, nothing. It just does, doesn't have rights, even though it's named root. With Docker, everything like this is possible. So you have to manually remove the rights with Docker, while you have to manually add those with Rocket. And that's basically why we decided for Rocket. That was the first decision. There's another one coming up later. Um, yeah, we're using Jenkins and Nexus to integrate the container build pipelines and the lifecycle management and the security checking. We use CoScale to uh, monitor our Kubernetes clusters because uh, CoScale is, in my opinion, uh, the most advanced monitoring tool for Kubernetes right now. Um, with CoScale, just to explain it a little, with CoScale you uh, deploy a daemon set to your Kubernetes cluster, and every node you deploy into the Kubernetes cluster will be automatically monitored, as well as all the containers in the cluster will be automatically monitored. Because CoScale directly integrates with the Kubernetes APIs, and with the container engines, and with the servers, so you monitor the full stack right away without doing anything. You just run CoScale. Etcd for sure is uh, the uh, key value store that Kubernetes uses. And uh, we are using Flannel uh, in the small clusters for development. And uh, Calico is uh, meant for the production clusters with multi-tenancy. So um, yeah. yeah. What will we do in the future? I yeah. think that's an interesting story. So, yeah, what, what's so, planned, yeah. <laughs> that also describes why we use Rocket right now. That's another point. Um, 
We have a secure pod manifest, meaning we don't uh, give the pod any rights, like the containers. Yeah. Uh, with Kubernetes 1.4, 1.5 uh, rockets, uh, had, uh, e each uh, container had a rocket process. So not like with Docker, you have a daemon to run the containers. Um, with Rocket, you have a binary running one container, or basically configuring and stating one container, and w which is not the case with Docker. Yeah? Um, the same manifest, except of uh, the API changes in Kubernetes, yeah? um, you can use for Kubernetes with uh, the Cree implementation. CRI means Container Runtime Interface. It's one more of the interfaces. The first was uh, CNI, the Container Network Interface, to make um, it possible that you can just exchange the network plugin and continue working. And uh, here with CRI, you see, you can just exchange the container runtime. This is a little broken, I'm sorry. So uh, the first one is ContainerD, which is now maintained by the Cloud Native Foundation, which was uh, the container runtime used by Docker. And created by Docker, you have the choice for Rocket Labs, um, maintained by CoreOS. You can use CRIO by Red Hat. And Zusa um, released, I think, two months ago, uh, per, uh, uh, of, let's say, a GA release of UMOCI, which is also a container runtime working with the CRI. And at the end, you exactly have the same picture. So you don't have to change your manifest except of the API changes uh, when moving from one Kubernetes version to the other. Yeah, so yep. the challenges or the future tasks we are working on, which we are implementing in our infrastructure, um, is large networks, meaning uh, a couple of hundred uh, Kubernetes um, nodes, and uh, also multi-tenancy uh, within the clusters as well as uh, distributed clusters, meaning uh, with Kubernetes you can set up multiple clusters. For example, you have a data center in Germany, you have a data center in US, you have a data center in France, in Belgium, and wherever else. Yeah? And you have in each data center a Kubernetes cluster. Then you can build up a cluster federation, and you can administrate all those Kubernetes clusters in all the different regions and data centers over one API, over one control plane. So you just execute one command, and it will be done in each data center, if you run it for each data center, or if you just uh, say, OK, I'm connecting to the German data center, but I want the US data center to change a version. This is possible. You don't have to care about it. Kubernetes takes care of this. Yeah? Uh, distributed databases um, and GPUs for machine learning is also uh, some topic we are currently working on. Yeah. So, so uh, this is an example for how we handle uh, big networks. So effectively, if you look into the basic network model of, of Kubernetes, you see uh, it's using a class B network, so 10 some fixed number, and then you have two digits uh, or two two um, two digits left or two, two two numbers left for addressing the node and for the pod. But this means that we are limited to 254 containers inside a machine of 254 containers or, or pods in in a, or on a single machine and. You, you will notice easily that the modern machines are handling more than thousands of containers. So even there are examples even that you can handle um, 2,700 Docker Nginx containers on a Raspberry Pi. So this means uh, this model for large machines is limited. And the second thing is even harder uh, in the standard model if you only have 255 addresses for your node, then this limits you to exactly this uh, network size. And we are going into a direction where we very soon will see this limit, and then we have to exchange the network model. And uh, this is possible because we have the uh, CNI plugin, and you can use this container 
network interface uh, to handle, to integrate and, and remove a container in your network. So it's called all the time a new container changes uh, its, its life cycle. So if, if a new container is created, you get a, a list of parameters which can be uh, used to integrate the pod into the network and then um, they have a daemon, this is a, a cat from Calico, Project Calico is doing it and they have another cat name chosen for their daemon, they have the Felix daemon which does the routing and, and sets the IP tables. And this is not enough because in a, in a big network you have to um, communicate these IP, uh, these, these, uh, IP routes and effectively they solved the problem at Calico um, turning a node into an entire data center. So they use the border gateway protocol which is collecting all the internet route information uh, and put it into a Kubernetes cluster. It's not connected to the BGP outside so this would be a severe security problem but they use the same technology, have a daemon bird, you can exchange it by any other border gateway protocol daemon and then it's connecting it to outside root reflectors that you have uh, really huge clusters which are informed about the routes inside the network. And the original network had, was an overlay net, uh, network. This was tunneling IP over IP without encryption, things like this. This is also going away and they connect to the physical fabric, which means you can integrate third-party products from our software-defined network vendors and get the full performance of your 10 or 40 or 100 gigabyte networks in Kubernetes pods, which is quite of, uh, interesting if you want to run high network workloads in Kubernetes. Yeah, and also this, I mean, uh, we separated our uh, networks in Kubernetes. So uh, our uh, Kubernetes infrastructure in our own data center um, has a different uh, network for um, deploying and uh, pulling applications, containers, and stuff like that. Um, and a different network for the internal cluster communication as well as a different network if you want to attach remote storage as well as we have a different network for the outside communication of the Kubernetes cluster. And uh, if you count all this together and then think about that SAP is currently running more than 150,000 servers in their own data centers uh, plus the co-location data centers plus, uh, you know, one, 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 yeah, so um, in common we have uh, like around, uh, I think at the moment, uh, 300,000 servers uh, where SAP is running on. So um, this is nothing you can run uh, with uh, 244, uh, or 254 uh, nodes in a Kubernetes cluster then you have to uh, build like thousands of Kubernetes yeah. clusters and this is just uh, incredible. So we will not do that. <laughs> and yeah. uh, why, um, why we use Calico? I mean, uh, there are others also running with BGP and uh, offering this, uh, these solutions likewise to Calico. But uh, basically, um, we, we know a lot of companies that use Calico at scale. And they are very experienced in that area. Yeah, so they are coming from the OpenStack community and have a lot of experience with it and they turn now into the Kubernetes business. There's a lot of companies which have experience with OpenStack. Yeah, like Mirantis. Yeah. Which was uh, basically the number one contributor to OpenStack. And they, are, they, they basically decided, I think, uh, one and a half years ago, uh, that uh, the future market for them is no more OpenStack, but it's Kubernetes. Yeah. And uh, I think officially it was uh, said a couple of days ago that they are now moving more into Kubernetes and uh, uh, putting down the OpenStack uh, stuff. So I think they locked it into a quite commercial product. Yeah. yeah. But we have to proceed a little bit. Yeah. So uh, next is okay. What really interesting is about database, you have, might have about this little white rabbit called the cap theorem. And on the other side, you have the 12-factor philosophy of how to run stateless systems. 
here you see the Knights of the Holy Twelve Factor Grail, and everybody of you who knows uh, the movie from Monty Python, I think this little innocent rabbit is killing uh, these knights for breakfast. So uh, what we kind of need is this holy hand grenade of Antiochia, which is orchestrating our workload for, uh, for distributed databases. We are not really, we don't have a real solution up to now, but we have ideas about this. And so uh, this is a real challenge, but distributed databases have always been very complicated and challenging, and this does not go away if you run it in Kubernetes. Yeah, just to, to add this at this point, we already have a solution for etcd, which is more or less a distributed database, even though it's called a key value store. But uh, our Kubernetes clusters internally maintain uh, the etcd store they are based on themselves. So we don't maintain the etcd cluster, and we don't use something like the etcd operator from CoreOS to maintain our etcd cluster. We basically let Kubernetes do the work. Yeah. Next challenge. So, uh, yeah, machine learning. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys heard from Zapclea. Zapclea is uh, the new machine learning product just uh, um, presented at the last Sapphire, which was uh, in June or something at the beginning of June, I think. Uh, I don't remember the, the real date, but uh, Zapclea from the architectural perspective, is working with Kubernetes. So uh, Zapclea integrates Kubernetes for machine learning purposes. And uh, we are continuing our work with the integration and um, pushing on to uh, NVIDIA and uh, also some yeah. others uh, to integrate multi-tenancy in GPUs. Which is not possible at the moment because GPUs are for graphics. Well, but really? I don't care. They should, they <laughs> should make it possible. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, and we need it. And not only we need it, basically everyone that wants to do machine learning and artificial intelligence with GPUs will someday in time need it because you don't want to run a GPU every now and when you have a load. You want to share the GPU and you want to run the stuff in parallel if possible. So it's needed. Yeah. They just need to implement it. Okay, so, so we are basically at the end of the um, presentation now. Are there any questions? Yeah. I think you get a microphone. <laughs> Regarding to the network, why don't you just go with plain network managed outside of container network interface? Because of your in your scale that you describe, it it might make sense. I'm asking, if, if, have you considered? Well, basically, we considered a lot of stuffs and we thought about a lot of stuffs, but. Um, having a network outside of Kubernetes means that network has to be maintained. Pardon? Well, yes, sure, there is a network that exists around, but this network is not maintaining the, the containers in the Kubernetes cluster, and you need to integrate the co containers in the Kubernetes cluster with, e with each other, yep. and you need to be able to access uh, the containers via load balancing in the Kubernetes yep. cluster uh, from outside, and uh, you want that to be dynamic. Stefan, effectively, the, uh, the, uh, Kubernetes is a da data center on steroids with moving around uh, ports and, and, and in, in a performance that no real hardware, other soft or hardware is able to handle this uh, automatically. So man manually adding these things is absolutely impossible. And the speed of container spawning and being removed is so uh, fast that you need kind of data center technology automized. Yeah, the point is, for example, just, just to, to overcome this for a moment, uh, you have a Kubernetes cluster, yeah? Your Kubernetes cluster has 100 nodes, yeah? 100 physical nodes that have physical addresses in the network layer, yeah? But on those 100 nodes, you have an application with five containers. Those five containers are running on three nodes. Now, 
if you come from outside, you don't know where to find those pods because the information is in Kubernetes. It's not outside. Yeah? So what you can do is you can basically have a load balancer outside to address the Kubernetes cluster on one of the pods, uh, on one of the nodes, and kubeproxy will then forward this request to the real node where the container is running and answer, uh, answering the request. But you don't want that. Because what you want is you want to have a direct request to the node and a direct answer outside. So what you want is a software-defined network orchestrated by Kubernetes. The only possibility otherwise you have is to have, for example, a five load balancer and have an ingress implementation in Kubernetes to uh, orchestrate a five load balancer. Mm -hmm. But if you come to a high changing and a really yeah. big Kubernetes cluster, the F5 load balancer will just stop yeah, working um, yeah. or basically <laughs> implement the rules uh, probably a minute after it changed and your service is down a minute. Yeah. Yeah? And this is something you don't want yes. to have. I think we can discuss it in more details. If yeah, I, th I think you should. And there's a great opportunity for you to discuss it in detail because you have half an hour coffee break right now. So if you can take all the questions <laughs> and discussion so, uh, into the coffee break. Uh, Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Stefan. Welcome. Uh, Thank you.